Welcome to Decarceration Nation, a podcast about radically reimagining America's criminal justice system. You can find all previous episodes on our website, www.decarcerationnation.com. And if you like the podcast, please remember to hit like and to subscribe to the channel below. Carrie Blakinger is an investigative reporter based in Texas. She covers criminal justice and injustice for the Marshall Project and writes Inside Out, a regular column published in collaboration with NBC News. She was a member of the Houston Chronicle's Pulitzer finalist team in 2018, and her 2019 coverage of women's jails for the Washington Post magazine helped earn a National Magazine Award. Carrie is also the author of the new book, Corrections and Ink, which we'll be discussing here today. Welcome to the Decarceration Nation podcast, Carrie Blakinger. Thanks for having me. Well, my pleasure. I've been planning to do this for a long time. I'm glad we finally had a, a, a more than the usual good reason. I always ask the same first question, which is normally how you get from wherever you started in life to where you were doing what you're doing now. But that's since we're talking about your book, and that's kind of what the whole book is about, uh, I think I'll just <laughs> ask you a different question now. And we'll, we'll cover cover the rest of it later. Um, so I'll just ask something that wasn't included in your memoir. Now that you're past all that stuff, what do you do for fun now? I seem to remember reading something about swords. <laughs> um, well, I run a lot. Um and I do crosswords a, a little bit obsessively, just oh. like I did in, in prison. Yeah, both of us did crosswords in prison, too. I'd forgotten about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the swords thing was just that um, people kept giving me sharp weapons. <laughs> <laughs> and it just sort of became a going joke. So, like, I have, um, I have a sword that one of my colleagues gave me. Um, we said if somebody donated to the Marshall Project and said, I forget, we had them, they needed to say one specific thing with their donation that um, she would buy me a sword. And she did. And it says something in Latin about like seize the records because, you know, I that's what file you do. a lot of open records requests. <laughs> um, but then I also have somebody gave me um, a sign mace, which is like a, a very solid, like club like object that. Um, it really feels like you could beat the shit out of somebody with it. Um, and, you know, as a, as a felon, I obviously can't, uh, you know, carry a gun like everyone else in Texas. Um, but I do keep a, a Maasai mace in my car. I also had like a retractable staff at one point, but that wasn't really like a good weapon per se. And I have um, a few shanks. Um, so, yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> I think those are legal, so I have. Oh, okay, them. I, ju I just have them. <laughs> I was I, trying um, to give you, trying to give you a loophole there. But. No, definitely looked it up. Definitely looked it up. Um, I, I definitely <laughs> look things up before I, I acquire any weaponry, no matter how small. Because uh, you know, because I mean, I live in Texas, as previously indicated, and Texas until recently had um, like. The little kitty keychains were very famously illegal here. The kind that are like, um, you put them on your, they're kind of like on your knuckles, but they have like a little sort of built in knife type thing. Not like oh. a knife. It's like a sharp, yeah, point, no, I know like you're an saying. ear. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not really a knife, but it's just a sharp thing that women would tend to carry. Like they're shaped like a little cat, you know, it's clearly marketed towards women and women would tend to carry them. And those were illegal until I think like the 2019 legislative session was kind of wild given how uh gun friendly texas is but yet you couldn't own the little and um, speaking thing. of laws and women uh you're the first person i've interviewed since the wave of regressive supreme court decisions uh, over the last week so i should probably ask you to share your thoughts on the current state of things here in lovely america you know i kept thinking that you know, I, I keep thinking about people in prison, obviously. You know, that's obviously where my mind goes. And I keep thinking that so many people, not the listeners of this podcast, but so many people that don't immerse themselves in criminal justice stuff regularly have really no concept of how little health care there is in women's prison. I mean, in prison generally, but specifically, women specific care is often worse than just the sort of average medical shittiness in prisons. And, um, you know, it just seems so, it seems like such a sad irony to be, 
you know, punishing women for their healthcare decisions by putting them in a place where they can't get that kind of help, where they can't get healthcare, period. Um, when I was, when I was locked up, I, um, I had my period for like six months at one point. And, you know, in the, on the outside, they would just give you like birth control or something to regulate it. It's not expensive. Like it's not hard. And, you know, it was, it was, that was in jail. That was before I got to prison. And they initially gave me some and then said, no, 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 sorry. We, we don't give anyone birth control. We shouldn't have done that. Um, just bleed too bad. And so I bled for six straight months, which, you know, I mean, that's, I don't really think I need to explain why that's really shitty. And, you know, you're getting strip searched all the time. Like there's a lot of reasons that's extra shitty when you're locked up and you, you know, don't have access to decent, you know, feminine hygiene products. And, you know, it, to me, it's, it's just one sort of low level baseline indicator as to how badly jails and prisons can take care of, of women and women's health issues. And to have it be that now more people are going to end up in jails and prisons for seeking health care, and they're going to be sent to a place where they're just not even getting a bare minimum of health care. It just seems, you know, it seems so unfair. And it just seems like such a sad irony. And I, I feel like I'm sort of still thinking through a better way to explain those connections to people. But those have been some of my initial thoughts on it. Before we get to the book, I uh, remember several years ago, we had kind of a back and forth about kind of the language people use to describe incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. We follow each other on Twitter. And I noticed today you were talking about one of the terms that uh, traditionally has been considered uh, offensive, the term offender, uh, which I agree with is a term that is anything but helpful. In fact, in an ironic twist here in Michigan, our reentry program that the state runs is called, believe it or not, Offender Success. <laughs> Which is about as oxy oxymoronic as it gets. Uh, so, so where are you on language usage these days? Because I, I feel like there's some, maybe there's a little change, maybe not. No, there isn't any change. I just never okay. liked offender. I think <laughs> that offender sounds, I've never liked offender or convict or criminal or ex-con. I feel like, you know, convict, if, if you're a, someone else who did time and you're calling me a convict, I know you mean it as a compliment. And that's fine. Like, like that's language that we can use as an in-group. But whenever someone else uses it, it is 99% of the time intended as an insult. And if you are in that small fraction who doesn't mean it as an insult, like, just read the room. No, that's how it's probably going to be received because that's usually how it's used, you know? So um, I, I don't like... I don't like um, ex-con or convict or criminal for all those reasons. Offender, I just don't like because it sounds so close to saying that someone is just an offensive person. Like, like I'm inherently an offense. Yeah, I kind of feel like that's true with almost all the language, though. If it's like, you know, what I said to you, I think at the time, it's been my rule forever, which is if someone who's been formally incarcerated calls themselves something, I have no problem with it. You can call yourself whatever you want. Or, you know, it, it, it's when people on the outside call us things that tend to bother me. Uh, I don't know. But it's I think our conversation was around prisoner and inmate. I, th I think it was felon, but I could be wrong. Oh, okay. I mean, I I don't tend to call people felons because I feel like that can really, like I call myself that, but I, I feel like that can be a kind of grating word to use. But, um, you know, but then there's some situations where if you're describing, you know, felony voting, like it is difficult to write an article without saying that because when you're writing an article, um, you know, the considerations around language are a little bit different than how I can consider language in conversation. I don't yeah. have a word count in conversation. I don't have to worry about character limits in conversation. And the other really important thing that I think it's really easy to miss if you're not living in the South is that like, I think a lot about how language will be received by the readers here who need to receive it the most. So people in the center and a little to the right, I don't want them to put down my story because they thought I was using woke language, you know? So what? like I can what? get around it and I can often say people in prison or prisoners. I do use, I use prisoners a lot. Um, um, but I recognize that when I 
say incarcerated people that there's definitely that definitely will turn people off to the really important things they need to to read in the story yeah i mean there's also i mean i guess there's the old thing with like uh what riot girl was doing a long time ago which is kind of trying to own the language of the oppressor and change it and stuff like that and i get that you know but if you're it's weird because i think in most cases i agree i think philosophically with a lot of the ideas that I think people on the right would call woke, but I also agree that it's a problem that they can tune out anything that they think is uh, using language that uh, they would consider to be problematic. I guess, how do we, is your thought that you're going to break that down somehow or change that uh, by getting them hooked? Is that, I mean, how do we get to the point where change comes from that? I guess either way. Well, I mean, I think that there not that you are... have to have the answer to that. Just <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> well, I do think that in Texas, I can I can see it. You know, I've written articles that um, lawmakers have read and you know changed policies. So, I mean, I haven't asked you know individual lawmakers, would you still follow my work if you you know if you saw it as using sort of language that you view as activisty, but I do have a sense of how things work in Texas. And um, I do think that it, there are audiences that would not pay attention to, you know, certain, you know, certain language choices. And you see it in the comment section sometimes, or, you know, people will respond to that and, and, you know, and, and call out that in particular, more commonly it would happen in emails, like reader emails, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I mean, obviously I'm not going to use offensive terms. Um, I'm also going to try to use terms that, um, that aren't going to turn off readers and that um, don't distract from the reading. Because this is the other thing is that sometimes um, I have to be aware that some of my readers are not going to even be familiar with the usage of some of these terms. Um, if I say, you know, I mean, I mean, some some conversations around reentry, I don't think that necessarily everybody knows what reentry means or a returning citizen. You know, that's a term that I think um, some people who are not involved or paying attention to the justice space, just sort of general readers in, in this area, at least in, you know, in Texas, might not intuitively understand. So I, those are some of the things I think I, I take into consideration. But the other thing is I know that some of these shifts have been about, you know, people first language to try to emphasize like humanizing people. And it's always been my thought that as a reporter who covers these in a sort of careful nuanced way if i am not humanizing people in the course of the story like i just if, if what it requires is if i have to tell you that this person is a person for you to remember that they're a person like i am fucking failing as a writer you know sure that makes some sense uh so I think uh, way now we'll kind of get toward the book stuff, and I think way too little attention is given to why people pick their quotes that start the book. So you start the book with a quote from Not Waving But Drowning by Stevie Smith. Can you talk about how and why you chose that quote? Yeah, that's a poem I've liked all my life, and I don't know, it seemed very apt in the sort of many years that I was struggling with, you know, mental health problems and addiction and suicidal depression and eating disorders. But it became more specifically germane to the book because I actually ended up referencing it in there because when I was in jail, I would, um, I would copy out poems from some poetry books that I that I'd gotten sent in. And one which I, I didn't even need to copy out because I already had it memorized was not waving but drowning. And I used toothpaste to you know, stick it up on the metal of the bunk above me. And I, you know, and I would read it all the time and, and I actually got it. I also, I forgot I'd gotten that poem in a 
book that another um, another woman gave me before she got sent off to rehab and then eventually to prison. And um, so it, I still have that book. It was a, that was a, I don't know, a valuable relationship to me because she was someone who had told me to start journaling and ended up being the reason I kept a journal and had the sort of basis to write a book. And in, in addition to suggesting that I write a journal, she'd given me this poetry book, which had not waving, but drowning. And I um, put that on the bunk above me and read it all the time. And it just seemed like that made it a good fit for the, um, I think that's called the epigraph, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that's right. I should know. Cause I had to negotiate <laughs> the rights on it. Like I should absolutely remember what the fuck it's called. Your book starts out at what had to be one of your lowest moments when you got arrested and first found yourself behind bars. Uh, a lot of folks either experience that same feeling or have a loved one who is arrested. Heck, I remember hearing a knock on my own door and seeing like 12 officers in the hall of my apartment. I guess it was something like 11 years, 12 years ago now. Uh, so what would you tell people about that experience or who might, ex you know, what, what, what else should people know about that? Wait, wait, what year did you get arrested? Oh, let's see, 2010. Oh, okay, me too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Small world, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this was in December 2010. You, um, you and me got arrested the same year, and uh, Shaka Senghor and I got out the same year, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Small world. Um, yeah, so I, I started with that um, because given what this book is about, it's about, you know, I mean, a large chunk of it is about my time behind bars and sort of how that shaped me afterwards. And, you know, I think shaped my career afterwards. Um, I, I thought that it only made sense to start there. And then after that, I jumped back and forth between sort of backstory and my time in jail and then eventually in prison. And, you know, I thought that it's a book about prison, right? And I thought about, you know, starting and sort of just going straight through chronologically, but that felt like you would read the first quarter of the book and have no sense of what the actual point is or what it's actually about if I did it that way. And I also sort of wanted to convey, I don't know, how confusing that start of um, a journey through the criminal justice system is and how, um, you know, how blurry so many of my drug years were. And, you know, also, of course, I wanted to convey, like, in those early days after your arrest, you're definitely thinking back a lot on your life before jail and how you ended up there. So I thought that starting with the arrest and then alternating between jail and these sort of flashback memory chapters um, made a lot of sense. Although I do remember that I think it was my agent or maybe my editor was like, you know, was kind of like, you, you start, you want to start with the arrest? Really? Are you sure? And I was like, no, no, no. I'm very sure about this. Like, this is the moment that makes the rest of the book exist. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, so let's start with some of the before stuff. Uh, I have to just because I don't think I've ever gotten to ask a, a former competitive skater this to ask a question about competitive skating. Uh, and for anyone who's listening or watching and doesn't know, Carrie was a very successful competitor, pa competitive pair, pair skater when she was younger. Uh, I, like most people, only see skating like every four years or so when the Olympics rolls around. But it seems from the outside like a sport where after years and even decades of incredibly intense practice, almost everyone falls. <laughs> And, you know, even the it's very, it seems almost unpredictable in a sense. And maybe that's why it's so popular. And the skills seem almost impossible and expectations seem insane. Uh, I, I mostly just feel sorry for people, you know, except the few times where someone actually hits their program right. What is your, what are your kind of thoughts about competitive skating now? And is any of that any fair? Was I being fair or unfair there? I don't even know. Um so, I mean, yeah, I think some of that's right. Um, I think looking back, one of the things that is really wild to me as an adult is that, so one of the big moments in a skater's career when I was skating, and this is still true to some extent now, is when you get a double axle or not. And a double axle is two and a half rotations. All the other double jumps are an even two. But if you get a double axle, 
you're probably going to get your triple jumps afterwards. And if you never get a double axle, like you're really not going to go anywhere. You're like, you're probably not going to make it to nationals. You're, you're certainly not going to be like elite competitive skater. And, um, you know, it, it, for me, I mean, it takes a long time for a lot of people. Um, for me, I started working on it right before middle school and was content. Like I didn't get my double axle until, um, the beginning of ninth grade. And the wild part to me is that means I spent every day for hours. Cause I would be skating for like two to four hours a day, plus other off ice training. You know, I would spend most of that time attempting double axles and falling on them literally hundreds of times a day. And as an adult, it's wild to me to think that I spent, you know, three young formative years just failing repeatedly at the same thing, literally hundreds of times a day. Like there's really nothing that is sort of equivalent to that as an adult. Like you have things that might take a long time or a long-term projects, but there's almost nothing as an adult that, that, you know, you run into in your career that involves like such incremental repeated failure again and again, and such clear failure. It's not like, oh, you know, this is a little better or, you know, they, you know, I don't know. I, I almost won this motion or a few judges <laughs> sided with like, no, it's, it's just like every few minutes you're falling on cold ice and it just seemed very normal then. But like looking back, I'm like, that's a really weird formative experience. And I can't really imagine doing that now. Yeah, I, I I can't imagine. It seems like it would also be quite painful and dangerous a lot of the time. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm a little risk averse. I don't well, know. Well, you learn how to you learn how to fall. You know, you learn how to fall properly. I mean, and uh, it's actually not. You you tend to fall in the same ways, so it's actually not as bad as it would look. Um, it's not like you're doing like a somersault and falling and going to fall on your head. Like you're really just going to fall typically on your hips, you know, cause you're rotating. Um, I, I, I would rotate over my left shoulder. So I would tend to fall. Um, you know, I, I would tend to fall on my like left hip, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, you learn how to fall. That's not as bad as it looks. Ice burn is really unpleasant though. Ah, yeah, that makes sense too. I mean, uh, that, that just seems like a tough, tough sport. Uh, so in your young life, and I'm maybe leaving some things out here, uh, your journey in, seemed to involve the competitive skating, uh, self-destructive streak, some perfectionism, some eating disorders, drug addiction, eventually sex work, and a bunch of other struggles, depression, some other stuff. Uh, now that you've kind of landed where you're landed and you can reflect you know, if someone were listening to this who is kind of struggling with some of that same stuff, would you have kind of any insight into, you know, in, in, into that period of your life? You know, this is, um, I get, I get asked this in sort of a lot of different ways. And I think it's an, frankly, an unfair question. Oh, people well, are like, <laughs> well, but I mean, people are like, sort of expecting that I'm going to have some nugget of knowledge that's going to like help people avoid addiction or eating disorders or whatever, you know? And I feel like looking back, the thing that sort of stands out is there's nothing that 38 year old me could tell 13 year old me that I would have listened to, you know, I do think that there were, um, you know, formative things in my life that probably pushed me in, you know, in, in self, in more self-destructive directions. Like I think that the lack of sort of normal social interaction as a result of skating, um, probably heightened all of those things. You know, I was spending, I think more time alone and just sort of more isolated than a lot of kids. And I think that makes it easier for depression and eating disorders to really take root because, eating disorders are not a group activity. <laughs> like you, 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 you end up sort of needing a lot of isolation for that to really fester. Um, so, I mean, I think there were things that sort of pushed me in a direction that I was clearly prone to going. Um, but I don't know, sort of big picture thoughts as to like how to avoid all that. Um, 
I don't yeah, know. I it's also so individualized, you know? I, I definitely understand what you're saying. I get asked questions like that too. And I'm not always sure exactly what to answer because, yeah. you know, what happened, what's true for me, even if what I have had insights certainly isn't necessarily true for everyone else. But I do feel like, you know, at the same time we've gone through these things, there's hopefully something we got, you know, that, yeah. that you know. That, you know, that, the one thing I do tell parents a lot, and this is not quite what you're asking at all, but um, I have a lot of times that parents will have somebody that is struggling with addiction and they're trying to figure out how to navigate this and how to parent, you know, with when one of their children is dealing, is, is dealing with addiction. And I think that, I think that traditional recovery programs have often taken the view that sort of any interaction or any um, financial or material support is enabling. And I I just think that's not true. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And I I think it was a really bad advice. Yeah. I think it's a really damaging thing. Like I think everyone's boundaries are in a different place. You know, for me, my parents um, helped pay for college, even when, you know, they were pretty sure I was using, but they weren't quite sure. Um, And I think that made a huge difference. Like, I think that that was, you know, I think that was sort of one of the few things that kept me at all grounded and not just being like, fuck it, I'm gonna move to Columbia, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I know, I agree. It's like, it's like, if you leave people, you know, in the worst possible place, they're going to do the worst possible things, not better things. They're, right. They're, you exactly. do have to set boundaries. I think everybody has to set boundaries mm-hmm. that are right for them. But I think the the thing that makes that particular advice so damaging is it convinces people that being cruel to other people is kindness. And, yep. and it just, it, 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 it like, in my experience, it's been incredibly da- uh, bad advice, uh, dangerous, you know, bad. Yeah. And if you cut off support networks, then, you know, people aren't going to have the resources to get help or, you know, to get sober. And I mean, you're also just sort of, it ends up encouraging people to lie to you more than they already would. I mean, obviously, self-care is important and, you know, you don't need to um, put yourself in a position where you're sort of needlessly harming yourself to um, support someone who's in an active addiction. But I, I just think that this whole idea that any any support is enabling is wrong and damaging. Do you have any other thoughts about kind of recovery and 12 step and stuff like that? I kind of famously conflicted about 12 step. Uh, do you have any thoughts? Kind of, I know you went through kind of periods of that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are people for whom it is great and wonderful and it works, and I'm not going to knock that for those people. But Um, I think that it is a model, it is based on a thought process that is fundamentally not conducive to women and um, vulnerable populations, a lot of vulnerable populations, because, you know, some of the sort of central tenets of it are things like, um, you know, are, are, are about sort of seeding power and control and ego and um, this was invented by a bunch of white men in like the forties and fifties, like people who had that sort of power and control and ego. And, um, it doesn't really take into account, um, past trauma. It tends to assume that the person who is in 12 steps was the abuser, was the person generating the trauma. Um, and I just don't think that that is typically the approach that a lot of women need. And I think this is also true for like, so, you know, people of color and other vulnerable populations, um, or it can be true that just sort of the model of 12 steps isn't necessarily conducive to their pasts and their needs. Um, but you know, I, I mean, I did 12 steps some in the beginning, like the first time I tried I, I say tried to get sober in air quotes. I wasn't really trying. I did. <laughs> I did. And I, I was still a mess. I knew I was still a mess. I don't think it's, I don't think it's at all the fault of any 12 step programs that I didn't stay sober that time. I was not in a place where I was going to. And I think I, I knew that, you know? Um, and then after I got arrested, I did go to like AA in jail and, um, 
it Which was is a special experience. I've done that too. Well, but you know what? It was just a chance to like get out of the cell block and be around someone who would have some level of respect for us and just be decent to us. And that was nice. And um, then when I went to prison, I stopped doing, um, you know, I stopped doing the 12 step programs. I also think that the whole abstinence only thing has been obviously problematic with um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I, for instance, had struggled with eating disorders for years. Like, I don't understand what, like, if abstinence only is the only way to solve addiction, no one would ever get better from eating disorders ever. Cause you have to learn moderation. Like that is literally what recovery looks like with eating disorders. And, um, and, and, you know, and I, I think that sure, there's a lot of people who just, you know, maybe abstinence is the only option or, um, maybe, there are certain things that they can just never touch again. Like maybe it's true that you're someone who was addicted to heroin and really can't drink alcohol again, but that's not everyone. And I think that it can be damaging to act like if you have ever done heroin and you have a beer, you have relapsed and you have lost all your clean time and you know, you're, you're back at step one. Yeah, I've seen, and there's so many times where I've seen, you know, people who really were, you know, really trying and are just totally devastated by that moment to the point where, you know, they're almost like, you know, I don't want to say suicidal, but so depressed that they're, you know, they can't even see a path forward because they worked so hard, they'd gotten so much sobriety, and then they made a mistake or did the wrong thing or at the wrong time. And I just, it, 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 it it's almost traumatic that moment is almost as traumatic as anything else that, that, that could have happened. I think in those situations, it's just, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I've seen it work in P pe for people and I've definitely seen it not work for people and it can be pretty spectacularly bad when it doesn't work for people. Um, you also, I think in one part of the book have, uh, at least there's one drug counselor who said something pretty terrible to you, uh, I've had some terrible experiences with therapists uh, before and after arrest and incarceration, but also had some really good experiences with therapists. Do you have kind of a thoughts on therapy after having gone through so much of this stuff? Um, you know, I I'm actually I'm not in therapy now. People ask me this, and that's I know that's not wasn't your question, but um, I I've had some therapists over the years that I think were great and amazing um one of them actually came to see one of my book talks in Lancaster and after I saw her I still went on to continue using drugs for years and you know that I don't think that means that she was a failure in any ways I just you know wasn't I wasn't there yet um but I also think that you know therapists have um a lot of a lot of power you know over a sort of how you see yourself, how you think of yourself, how you approach the world. And, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that I, you know, that there's so many that just were not good at their jobs in, in the drug addiction treatment world. Um, in fairness, those were mostly counselors, not like licensed psychotherapists. But, um, you know, the idea that just because you survived addiction means you're somehow inherently uh, qualified to to treat it. I think is not accurate. Like it can be, it can be an extra helpful added experience. It's kind of like a weird example of bootstrapping. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I feel like it's great to know that your counselor has been through some of the same things, and that can be. A great bond, a great sort of starting point um, in terms of trusting someone, but that's not enough. Like that doesn't confer some, you know, higher knowledge that in and of itself makes them qualified, you, you know, uniquely qualified um, without any additional information or training or whatever. And it, you know, as as you alluded to, I had one counselor that made a comment that if I, you know, been raped more than once, that it was my fault. And it's kind of wild to me to look back on that and I, you know, and think that, and this is a woman, you know, that, that she would think it was a good idea to say that to a 
I think it was 17 at the time, might've been 18, um, to 17, 18 year old. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm sure she wasn't a bad person. I think, you know, there, I think that part of that is the sort of tough love approach to treatment. Um, and this whole sort of 12 step idea of taking responsibility. I just don't think that your own rape is something you should ever be telling someone to take responsibility for. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. And I mean, you had some incredibly horrific experiences uh, during that period with sex work and drug addiction. Uh, we're kind of, at least we were, it's kind of hard to know because we've got this kind of new tough on crime way of going right now. But we were finally seeing some change around, at least with some prosecutors, around the criminalization of sex work. Do you have kind of thoughts about having experienced some of this, kind of where we are, where we should be, what, you know, could happen or should happen? Again, not looking at you as a savior, just you have more experience in this than, than perhaps some of the people I would talk to about this. I mean, I think like with a lot of things, when it is criminalized, there are, you know, it, that adds danger. You know, that means that the people involved in that work are, you know, having to go through back channels and be in shadier places, you know? Like, um, I have to imagine that I probably wouldn't have needed to be walking around the streets of Chinatown at 2 a.m. Um, if it were legal. Um, so yeah, I, and I also think that the sort of the subcultures that grow up around activities when they are illegal can be really um, dangerous in, in sort of very specific ways. Um, you know, like I think, I mean, I think that street sex work has a different set of rules and culture than, than you know, escorting, for instance, or working in a strip club. Like there's a lot of overlap, but um, I definitely ended up in a lot more situations that felt quite unsafe when I was doing street sex work. And I think that part of that is because of the nature of how that market works when it is not legal. Hmm. Well, uh, now I guess it's uh, time to turn to kind of the more incarceration part of the book. Uh, one thing I think I should ask first, because, you know, obviously, while I've ex experienced incarceration, I've not experienced incarceration in women prisons and jails. Uh, I think we too often assume incarceration is kind of a generic system uh, with a generic incarcerated person, which uh, usually ends up being a man. Uh, do you want to talk about some of the, you've talked about some of them already, but some of the unique problems with women's prisons and jails, uh, you know, including overcrowding and anything else you want to you want to add in before we kind of talk more specifically about things you mentioned uh, more directly in the book? Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I think that women's prisons are are bad in such different ways from the ways that men's prisons typically are. And I think that there are ways that are in some way that feel a little bit harder to objectively quantify sometimes. For instance, in men's prisons, there's a lot more violence in fights, you know, and people are more likely to get beat by the guards. Like, I didn't see a ton of that. It did happen occasionally, but I did not see a ton of people getting, of women getting beaten by guards. People don't tend to hit women as easily as they will men. Um, I mean, male officers don't tend to hit women as, as quickly, as easily as they would men. And I think that, that, that violence is a very objective, easy thing to look at and say, this prison is bad. Like that is clearly a bad thing. But, you know, there's some head games and humiliation that I think those kinds of things seem to be more pronounced in women's prison. And I think that that is a different kind of psychological torture that exists in men's prisons also, but I think is more pronounced in women's and is more subjective. So I think it's a little more difficult for people to see or understand these distinctions. Um, you know, I think one of the sort of most clear examples of this would be uh, strip searches when you're on your period. 
like they would make you take out your tampon and I was in New York. So I, you know, I think New York prisons are generally less bad than the prisons I write about now, which are predominantly in the South. Um, yeah. But I, like it is. The South so, is uniquely terrible. But Yeah. Yeah. It is so humiliating to have to, you know, take out a bloody tampon during a strip search and so unnecessary because honestly, if I had contraband stuffed up in there, like, I don't need the tampon to keep it in. It's not like some vagina cap, you know, it just, I'm just like, I don't understand if they don't know how female anatomy works that you think you need to make the person take out a bloody tampon. I mean, even if I did have drugs in there, how was I going to get them behind the tamp? Like none of it makes sense. Um, but in Texas, uh, one of my friends who did a lot of time in Texas was telling me how they would get strip searched every day when they'd go out, when they called, you know, what they called the ho squad would go out to work in the fields and you would have to strip in front of the whole squad. So that's, you know, half a dozen, a dozen, up to 30 women. And, you know, if you're on your period, you'd have to take out the tampon in front of all of them Mm. and hold it up for the guard to inspect. And like, that is so unnecessary. Like nobody's, that's not stopping contraband. That that's just humiliation for the sake of it. And I think that's a very clear example, but I think that there's sort of a lot of examples of ways in which women's prisons rely more on shame and humiliation to keep people in line and men's prisons rely more on violence. And, you know, those are both bad in different ways. And we understand like violence is a lot easier to see and quantify. And I think that some of the ways that women are treated can just be damaging long term in in very different ways um and of course there's also always the overarching threat of you know sexual abuse because so many of these prisons have sex abuse scandals um and that's obviously a whole other you know threat that works differently in women's prison than in men's like i know that is obviously a thing in men's prison but it's it's again it's different because it's not typically the guards raping inmates uh another thing that i I know i struggle with at times uh we are both you know well-educated formerly incarcerated white folks uh who are somewhat publicly known (laughs) uh you probably more than me uh but it's 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 a little weird at times because a lot of times i'll even say this that you know predominantly the experience of incarceration is not i mean there are plenty of white folks in prison but it is you know the story of mass incarceration to me you know i think i said it on the very first episode of the podcast that you'd have to be willfully blind to walk into a jail or prison in the united states and not see the racial disparities uh can you talk a little you talk about in the book can you talk a little bit about kind of privilege race and incarceration yeah, sure. I mean, this is, like you said, this is a thing I've, I talk about in the book and I've talked about it before the book. I think a lot about how um, people, I think it's really easy for people to overlook the role of white privilege on a sort of individual basis. Uh, when you look at like a given anecdote and you say, well, I can't say for sure that the judge in this case was considering race or there's really no comparable case. So I can't really say would a black person with the same amount of drugs have, have gotten the same sentence. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons that it's easy for some people to choose to not acknowledge the role of, of race and white privilege in criminal justice outcomes. But when you step back and look at the big picture and sort of realize that every point along the way adds up. I think then it's easier to see that even if you can't definitively say this would have been different if I were black, you can say in the aggregate, there's all these different points at which things could have gone differently. And data shows at some point they probably would have. So for instance, with with my sentence, um, I can't say for sure that the judge would have sentenced black person differently it's it's actually really hard to to say that in my case because there is no comparable arrest in that county in that time frame with those sort of politics going on and people would point that out to me and they'd be like 
yeah, but you really don't know. And um, this was actually a kind of harsh sentence for that very progressive county for someone with a first time offense. And, you know, that's all true. But I still quite reasonably think that if I were a person of color, I probably would have ended up with a longer sentence um, for a number of reasons. One of which is that, you know, I'd had I'd been using drugs for nine, ten, nine years at that point. And I can think of so many interactions that I had with police in which I was very clearly doing something quite suspicious and they chose to walk away or to ignore it. And, you know, I know that if I were someone with black or brown skin, someone who was more likely to just be viewed as suspicious by police, um, many of those interactions could have gone differently. And that would have meant that I would have had a criminal record by the time I did get arrested in 2010. So even if that judge had somehow miraculously not been influenced by race at all, I still would have gotten a much longer sentence because I would have had more priors and I would have qualified for a harsher sentence, even though I would have been doing the same things. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's part of why it's really easy for people to choose to overlook the role of race, because you can always sort of pinpoint a very specific decision and say, well, but you don't know. And, you know, maybe you don't in the individual instances, but, you know, you can look at the data and the aggregate and, and understand that there's all these other factors that could have, there's all these other inflection points at which things could have gone differently. Well, we could probably talk about a million of the particular things uh, that we both experienced in incarceration together uh, or in different places, but it, that were similar. Uh, but one thing I thought was a, a really interesting turn of, of a phrase, you said in a sense that being incarcerated was like being erased. Uh, and I, I thought that that was there was a lot of truth to that. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, you know, I thought about this, um, when, well, I thought of this in a few different contexts of that, but it felt especially clear when I got out and, you know, there's, I don't know if you noticed this, but like when I first got out, it felt like everybody looked at me in a certain way. They knew what I'd been in for. So it wasn't like this was like some surprise, but like, you're not, um, like they don't trust that you're going to stay out. You know, they look at you in some way, you can see it in their eyes that they think you're just sort of there temporarily. And then you're going to get violated and you're going to go back to prison. Um, even people that say they believe in you. And um, I don't know, that sort of, that felt like, like I was less, of, like I was less of a person. Um, but, you know, that's partly because I'd been erased for two years at that point, you know, all of these relationships that existed through snail mail, like not in person, not necessarily even a voice. Like so many of the people that I would see on the outside are people that I hadn't kept in touch with, like by phone during the time I was in. And um, aside from being sort of erased from their lives, it's also this big gap for me. Like there's still 10 years later, there's times I'll hear a song and I'll be like, Oh, that's a cool new song. No, that shit's 10 years old. It just came out during the two years <laughs> I missed, you know? And it's like this hole in, in your cultural awareness. So, you know, I try not to spend too much time uh, talking about, you know, re describing the trauma and all that kind of thing. And every once in a while, I think one of the things that's really interesting about your book, if you read it a particular way, one of the things you really get out of it is how much community there is from the people who are incarcerated together. And there's a couple of things in the book that I thought were really uh, great examples of that. Uh, you mentioned a bunch of people all of a sudden spontaneously breaking out singing Cl Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> and you said this was not just women singing. This was l women learning how to steal joy in a place built to prevent it, which I thought was an incredibly uh, well-written uh, uh, phrase. 
Uh, the other one is you talked about kind of communally created meals. You know, we have this one, on the one side in prison, you have this terrible food. And the other side, you have commissary and people kind of in a stone soup kind of way to get together a lot of times and, and make cookups together. And those are actually pretty, pretty amazing. I don't know. Do you, do you find that you think of prison as a terrible place, but remember a lot of the community that was created there or do you just think of it as a terrible thing how, how, how do you remember it i guess um i mean yes i obviously i think of prison as a terrible thing <laughs> yeah i mean but, sure it is i mean <laughs> but um but yeah you know i i also i keep in touch with a lot of those women I keep in touch with, um, I think probably a larger percentage of people from that period of my life than a lot of others. And it's interesting now when I'm interacting with them or when I see someone in person or talk to them after not having talked to them in years, it's interesting how much we pick up where we left off sort of like there aren't the same, um, our lives have changed, but it's, it's not like the same sort of gaps and disconnections that I sometimes feel if I'm talking to someone that you know from high school or college or something and I I think that sort of no matter how much we change and grow and move in different directions like prison is a uniquely traumatic experience and the bonds that you form from surviving that together are a very distinct kind of bond yeah I definitely would agree with that uh so, do any of them still call you Harry Potter? So the real question. No, I'm just kidding. Well, sometimes, uh, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Um, so there was somebody just. It wasn't that long ago that one of my friends that from prison that I talked to was talking to someone else who kind of knew me, but like we weren't close, and was like saying that I'd written a book, and they were like, "Harry, who's that?" And she was like, "Harry Potter." So yes, that is still how some people remember me. <laughs> Which is weird because I agree. I don't think you look particularly like Harry Potter, but I guess, uh, you know, at a moment in time. I think I looked more like Harry Potter in prison because I had a little bit rounder glasses. I didn't have half my head shaved. It was all, you know, the same length. And, you know, it was not, it, it was not a very good haircut. I mean, it probably looked like Harry Potter hair and I didn't have the tattoos I obviously wasn't wearing piercings in prison and in New York prisons we wore collared shirts mm. so I think that sort of all of that together um also I know at the time my brother kind of did look like Daniel Radcliffe so like <laughs> I didn't see it in myself but like I can accept that it was probably there a little bit <laughs> uh I have to ask this question because it's just I, I've never come across this before, and it's got to at least uh, there the con that you almost had to have multiple consciousness at several times during this period of your life, uh, and I I'm sure it's happened before, but you ended up living with one of your former correctional officers after incarceration. I, I don't even know how to ask a good question about this, but it seems like that had to have been uh, interesting at the very least. Is there anything you would say about that? Having been in all the different, you know, having been an incarcerated person trying to have a regular relationship with someone who's a correctional officer. Um, I mean, you know, obviously we, we broke up. So <laughs> I think that says a lot. Sure, it just <laughs> seems so improbable out. in the first place, but you know. Yeah, you know, I mean, I I don't I don't think it was a good decision. I'm, you know, in retrospect, I don't think it was a good decision for either of us. Um, I think that the sort of relationship starting off with that kind of power differential makes it really hard to transition to a relationship where you're on more equal footing. Um, and I think that was difficult. I mean, there, there were other problems and, you know, there were other issues, but I mean, out of the bad decisions I could have made in early sobriety, like that is surely not the worst decision I could have made. So, I mean, I'm not like beating myself up about it, but I, I don't think that was a good decision for either of us. And, you know, I, I don't think he's a bad person, though, so I'm, I'm not going to just 
So, oh, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's <laughs> tough because I definitely, you know, there were definitely correctional officers that I even to some extent had respect for. There were just a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a very tough, I don't know, it's a tough nego- thing to negotiate. I, 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 I'm, I'm impressed that you were able to, to yeah, I think that, that work for a while. I think that, you know, part of it was that in, so, so I think women are generally Um, conditioned to valuing male attention right and you know you're sort of taught that this is a thing you want I mean obviously nobody wants to be catcalled and that sort of thing but generally as a kid like from you know just society teaches you to value attention from men and I think that in a very vulnerable place in early sobriety when I'd just been arrested um, I was particularly interested in anyone who seemed to think I had any value at all and um, you know would would pay me any sort of positive attention so I think I was in a place where I was sort of not going to enter into a relationship for the right reasons and it did not seem to me like that then it should have been obvious I knew I was in a vulnerable place and I was like no that's not the reason I'm doing this at all Um, and I was very convinced of that. But I think looking back that after that relationship, I mean, a few years after that relationship, you know, I, I actually, I, I had always identified as bisexual and I would now identify as gay because I realized once I got out and sort of became a reporter who was doing work that, um, you know, that I don't know that I find deeply meaningful. And I started to be convinced of my own inherent value because I realized that I could do things that were valuable. Uh, I actually realized that I think I'd been engaging in relationships with men for the wrong reasons. Like, I I don't think I was actually ever attracted to men. I think I was um, attracted to what I'd been taught to value, you know, male attention. And um, I think that was part of how I ended up in that relationship in the first place but I don't know maybe I'm just saying something that sounds really insightful maybe in five years I'll be like nope totally was wrong about that (laughs) that sounds sounds good to me uh speaking of really impressive things you've done one of my favorite stories is what you did to help people get teeth in Texas can you talk a little bit about that for people who haven't heard that story yeah sure so when I was at the Houston Chronicle um, in, I guess, 2017, 2018, I started covering prisons. And this was, you know, a few years after I got out, I got out in 2012, and then became a reporter and um, eventually uh, moved to Texas. And I was at the Houston Chronicle and got a tip that Texas prisoner that men on death row were going to get dentures. And I was like, wait, 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 what? They don't get teeth? Because in New York, if you didn't have teeth, you would get dentures. And it didn't occur to me that it would be different, that, uh, that other states would just deny someone an entire body part. And I called the, the prison spokesman the next day and I was like, hey, is it true they're all getting dentures? And he was like, no, where'd you get that? That's not happening. So then I started investigating. And after 11 months of, of, you know, trying to report out the story and putting in records requests to get like data and policies and trying to track down the sort of, you know, the people that I needed to be the face of the story, like the, the people who had not been able to get teeth and, you know, going interviewing them and getting their grievances and letters. Eventually I finally wrote a story saying, hey, Texas prison system, instead of giving people teeth, they will take mess all tray, put it in a blender, puree it, pour it in a cup and give it to you as a blended diet, which they said was a better alternative to the chewing and mastication process. Mm. And um, after I wrote that story, there was one particular Texas state lawmaker who was really irked by it. And he pushed the prison system to do something about it. And so they bought a 3d printer and started 3d printing dentures um there's still i've I've followed up on this and there are still a lot of people who need teeth and don't get it because their criteria are not nearly as broad as one would hope but there are several hundred people who have gotten teeth that would not otherwise have them so um 
you know, that's been, that's the sort of amazing impact that, um, you know, that I think you, you dream of as a journalist. And, you know, I didn't even think that was a possibility when I wrote that story. I figured I was just writing a story about yet another fucking terrible thing I see in prisons. And that's an interesting thing. You've been writing for years about Texas prisons, one of, you know, I would say one of the worst, probably seven or eight prison systems in the country. And uh, how do you keep, you know, it's even, what's even worse is you're in a state that only has a legislative session, I think. Every other year. Every other yeah. year for a very short period of time. I mean, the joke is that if, if it was more frequently, they just, fuck more shit up so like, <laughs> they just, they the just have more time to make want it every year here yeah uh, but that's still how you know it's very hard to get anything done in a abbreviated session uh because you know legislation generally takes time uh how how do you keep from becoming entirely cynical on a state that seems to thrive on that kind of cynicism i guess hmm um I, you know, I, I mean, I am, I think a pretty cynical person. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, but, you know. But you're still writing stories and you're still I, trying I to I am, make yeah. And I mean, there are things that change. I mean, I think Texas has changed a lot. It's depressing when you look at the things that haven't changed and the things that get worse. But, um, you know, when you look at what Texas prisons look like, 40 years ago, things are clearly in a better place. Um, you know, some of it's the result of class action lawsuits that have completely remade the face of the prison system over the past, you know, four or five decades. And then, um, you know, some of it is investigative reporting and some of it is just, you know, some of it's legislative change, although I think that often doesn't change the conditions or the you know, that that's more about sort of um, the, the front end and the back end, like legislators don't tend to touch the conditions themselves quite as much. Um, but, you know, the other big thing is, I mean, because of the pandemic, the population is down by like 25,000 and we didn't rebound in population like some other states did. Well, so, I think a lot of places were like not accepting people from jail. And so once the emergency ended, they all of a sudden had a ton more people because everyone just been held in, in county jail. So that's not happening in Texas. So that did happen, but it somehow never spiked the population again. Like it was true that they, that people were held in county jail and were not being, you know, sent along to prison. But when they started catching that up, it didn't create a population spike. Before the pandemic, there were around 145,000 prisoners in Texas, and now it's a little under 120,000. And it's, I mean, this is, you know, enough later that we would expect to see some of that, those numbers have gone back up, um, but they haven't. Um, I think part of that is because of backlogs in the courts. So there are some people that, you know, have still probably have pending cases from pre-pandemic, I would, I would imagine. But um you know, some of those, the longer those cases go on, I think the less likely it is that people end up in prison. We both worked pretty hard to raise consciousness about COVID in prisons and jails. Uh, you say in the book, the first year of the pandemic taught me more about the casual cruelty of prisons than the 10 years before it had. Uh, my friend Amanda Alexander always talks about the power of dreaming big and of having freedom dreams. Uh, so this season, I've been asking people what dreams they have about changing our system uh, or eliminating our system do either do, do you have a uh, kind of a vision for 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 the future or what what you hope we or you will accomplish i do not <laughs> and i i mean i don't because you know i live in the south and i feel like the things that people dream about, the, the, the things that so many of the advocates and activists that I know dream about are so far from reality here. And I, I think many of them are very far from reality elsewhere, but they might feel closer. Um, 
And I feel like, you know, when we have conversations about, for instance, abolition, that doesn't feel like a helpful framework for my work here because we're not going to abolish prisons in Texas. You know, that's not, that's not going to happen. And in the meantime, there's a lot of people in those prisons that are suffering. And, you know, I think folks that take a sort of abolition only approach and that, you know, any investment in the system is a step away from abolition do so um, at the risk of harming the people who are currently there. And that feels particularly true in the South. So I don't have, um, I don't have a dream of, uh, of a world where, you know, there are no prisons because I, I don't think about that in Texas. I instead just try to focus on, you know, pushing, pushing on the soft spots and having telling stories that have impact on the people that are, that are there now in the ways that I can have impact. So do you, does that mean you don't think that there, are, so I, you know, I, I go back and forth on this a lot. I obviously spend a lot of my time doing legislative work, uh, But I also think that, you know, there's kind of two stories of politics. There's the story that politics is the art of the possible and you're just it's a realist world. And, you know, what kind of what you were just describing in a way. But then there's also the kind of Overton Windows story of politics, which is every once in a while something spectacular happens. And I don't mean necessarily abolition of prisons, but, you know, the right people, the right message at the right time can create certain and have in the past at moments created you know, fairly substantial change. Are you saying you you have no interest? You're you're just looking at what can be well, accomplished today, or are you? Well, so here's the thing. I'm also not an advocate. Like I can't be. I'm a reporter. I wouldn't sure. be employable if I were out here being an activist. Um, and and I mean, so I don't like. It's just not fruitful for me to to sit around envisioning these things that I can't talk about or write about. What I can do is is hold the system accountable for where it's fucking up. And in doing so, that work can have impact. Um, But I mean, I can't really go that far down this road about like talking about abolition because again, like, you know, you can't, I mean, this is a sort of old school belief about what journalistic objectivity looks like, but you know, you can't sit here and talk about as as journalists, you can't, you know, sit here and talk about um, sort of reimagining or the whole system or burning it all down. I do own a, is I wearing it now? I'm not, I do own a burn it all down shirt, <laughs> but you'd have to just, yeah, this is a very interesting to me because if there's anyone I thought might be a burn it down person, it would be, you know, it might be you. I don't know. No, I mean, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm not though. Um, partly because, you know, I, I can't really, it's not fruitful for me to sort of engage with what world I would imagine when I, I can't actually, talk about that because in the work that I do, if I want to continue doing the work that I do and having impact in the ways that I have, that means that there are some things I have to not be out there with my opinions on. Hmm. And does that mean you, you can't have a personal political life? I'm just curious because I've, I've, I've heard it's, I've I've never, I guess, really talked to someone who does journalism and in a way that, I mean, everyone talks that you you hear people talk about the old school game, but you don't really hear you know, this you know, it varies and it's changing. So like there are some people I know who will not vote in primaries because that would show political opinions or bias. Um, I, I think that's a little bit extra. You know, I, 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 I don't have a problem with voting in primaries. Um, but, you know, where people draw the line is certainly not where it used to be. I think that some of the things I'm saying now would not have been acceptable 10 years ago. Um, even just sort of basic things like saying that, you know, prisoners should have teeth or should be treated like <laughs> humans. You know, I, I don't, I think that would have been too opinionated at, at some point. Um, but, you know, generally the idea is that you shouldn't have opinions on the things you're writing about. So like, if you're a, um, you know, if, if you're covering prisons, you, you know, a lot of mainstream journalism is the the sort of old school belief would be that you can't have 
um, sort of big picture opinions about like abolition. Now there are outlets like um, like Truth Out or The Appeal that don't care if their reporters have those views. But I think that the mainstream outlets that have the biggest audiences and the best chances for having impact, because you do need to write for an outlet that has a bigger audience to have the best chance of impact, because that's how you shame these prisons into changing is by, you know, by writing about, by holding them accountable to a large audience. Well, and to keep doing that, you know, the trade-off is that you have to not have certain kinds of opinions. Now, in terms of like, can you have a personal political life? Like, sure, I'm a human, I have opinions, I have beliefs, but the idea is that you just can't be stating them publicly or else people will think you're not objective. I think that's a ridiculous belief because everyone should know you have opinions, you're human. Um, I think it's actually better transparency if you're open about what those opinions are. See, I'm but, openly skeptical about the idea that anyone can be objective anyway. I, I guess postmodernism has bled into me enough to believe that. No, I, I, I agree. I think yeah. it's, and I think it's more transparent to say what your opinions are, but that's not where journalism is right now. And if I want to continue doing this work, then yes, it means that there are certain things that I can't be out about opinions on, which also means that. I don't spend a lot of time dreaming about what a different system would sure. be, you know? Well, let me ask you a journalism question then. This is as we're kind of trans transitioning toward the end here. Um, I think for a lot of us in the advocacy and the, and, the, and, and other kinds of spaces doing this kind of work, we get very frustrated with mainstream journalism because with, you know, obviously yourself and some other folks are exceptions, but a lot of it, seems to come from a very carceral point of view. A lot of it only seems to be police and prosecutors. A lot of it never seems to ask for data to check any of the back, check back any of the facts that the, you know, the, the claims that those people are making. And, and, and I think it, you know, it's very frustrating uh, because like you're saying, so few people who have any knowledge beyond that have access to those large microphones uh, is what you're doing the way to change that? Or, you know, what, what, is there a critique of journalism? Is there a way to approach journalism as journalism that might change that? Oh, well, I think, first of all, it is changing. I think if you look at what is considered best practices now versus 10 years ago, you do see improvement. Um, and I think that, yes, people having journalists that have, contact with the system is one way that that changes um kind of one way in which the system fucks itself like if you are big enough that everyone is connected to it then it becomes personal and more people will understand you know what was wrong with you know the ways that the system has been covered in the past but um you know it, i still i'm still struck often by how far we have to go um I think you probably saw these tweets, but, you know, a couple weeks ago, I was on a show where they put in the Chiron, um, they called me a prostitute in the Chiron. Um, and, you I know, did I see was, those tweets. I did. Yeah. And, you know, and I've also been, I've had um, outlets that I respect call me a convict and, and I, I get that they weren't trying to be disrespectful, but, you know, like I said before, like that does seem like a word that like, it's pretty clearly almost always used as an insult. And I just don't understand why you would choose to use a word that is nearly always used as an insult. Um, and, you know, there's also, we talk a lot in journalism about how just writing about the initial arrest and never following through to see what happens is not a good practice. Like that is something that we've all agreed you know, should move away from. But I, I've been struck by how many outlets had no problem putting my mugshot on, you know, all over their national websites with, you know, tens of thousands of viewers and had no interest in writing about me now. And I mean, I'm not making like a big deal of it. I'm not going to, you know. Hey, like, I, I totally me. understand. Yeah. Uh, a couple months ago, I got asked for a quote from NPR. I gave them the quote and their national feed had me as Josh Ho sex offender. So 
Wow. <laughs> I was like, thanks. I'm glad I helped you all out with that. <laughs> People are calling me from like Georgia. You know, I'm like, hey, Jesus. that's great. Yeah, that's that's why that's the name I like to go by. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's see, this is this is a, a situation where I do think that individual reporters like make a difference because. I've written stories in which I've had to have a conversation with the editor about like, do we need to put in this person's crime? I really think it's not germane to this story. Maybe we don't need it in this one. But traditionally, you would put in their crime for everything, just like you would put in someone's age if you interview them at a protest, you know? Yeah, don't get me wrong. If my if the story had been about my offense or something right. like that, that's exactly. a different thing. But they were exactly. asking me for a totally unrelated opinion. <laughs> right. And there's also situations in which I can imagine a story was not about like your particular offense, but it might be germane, you know, but like when I'm writing about healthcare, it doesn't matter what someone's in there for. If you're not giving them teeth, that is a problem. It doesn't matter what they're in there for. Yeah. Uh, so I like to ask people uh, if there are any criminal justice related books that they like and might recommend to our listeners. Uh, do you have any favorite criminal justice related books that people might enjoy aside from your own, obviously, <laughs> which we're already pl plug in plenty here. So, <laughs> so um, I feel like this is this is cheating if I say this, because um, it's actually a book I uh, haven't haven't read yet because it's not out. I am so looking forward to Pam Koloff's book. I don't know if she even has a pub date yet, but she's been working on this for like a year or two. And she's an amazing writer. And um, she did, so this is based on a, a, a story that she did for the New York Times Magazine about um, this guy who was wrongfully sent to death row based on jailhouse snitch testimony. And it's a really crazy case. And there was all this stuff she told me about at the time that there wasn't room for in the story. The story was like 10,000 words, but she had done enough reporting to easily write, you know, 100,000. And it's been so, it's, it's been so neat to, you know, hear about her reporting over the past few years. And I'm so looking forward to this book because she's an amazing writer. And I also think that, she's done a really difficult thing of, of taking something that, you know, could have been just a story about a death penalty case and actually using it to show something much bigger that's wrong about the system. And she's done that in a few different stories. Like she wrote about um, someone who was wrongfully convicted based on um, blood spatter forensics. And um, now she's, you know, her latest had been about jailhouse snitch testimony and how sort of fucked up and unreliable it is and it landed this guy on death row even though there were clear indications that the person who put him there uh you know should have been guarded regarded with some level of suspicion yeah i just had chris fabrican on earlier who did a whole book on junk science that was a lot uh, similar kind of people who'd literally done you know been on death row 30 years stuff like that later DNA cleared them, you know, based I see on... His, I noticed his book behind you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's a, unfortunately way too much of that. Uh, so your book is Corrections in Ink. How would you recommend, or if there is there any particular place you would prefer people find your book? Um, no, it doesn't matter, you know. I, I mean, support your local indie, but it doesn't it doesn't matter on my end, what, you know, whichever, whatever method is convenient for you, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Indies. Um, you know, I've also been trying to get people to buy copies that will be donated to prisoners. And there's a link to that on Porchlight that I've been tweeting out. It's there's, there's very few, it's hard to navigate to, there's no good landing page for it. So I've just been tweeting it out some, although if you send me that link, I'll put it in the show notes. Too. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll send that. Um, also, I think if you go to corrections in ink book.com it links you, it sends you to a page that has links to a bunch of places you can buy it for yourself. And then also a link to where you can buy it for a prisoner. So that's great. Uh, I always ask the same last question when I mess up, what question should I've asked, but did not. Oh, geez. I don't know. <laughs> We've been talking for like an hour and a half. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> There doesn't um, have to be an answer. I just like I to put that no, out I, there in case there's something you wanted to talk about that I didn't get to. 
No, I also feel like, you know, I've been talking about this book for, you know, a couple weeks now. So, I mean, I've gotten to say a lot of the things <laughs> at some point, you know. Well, that's good. Uh, are you having fun, I guess, doing the the tours and the, or is it getting uh, old already? <laughs> well, it's been fun seeing people in some of the different cities. Um, it's been fun being able to run in different cities and things like that. But um, a lot of the places I went on tour were also places that I knew a lot of people and would have an audience. And that means that those are places where I spent time and often lived some of the really dark parts of my book, you know? Um, so that's been, that's been a lot to take in, you know? So it, it's, it's been a sort of, you know, interesting book tour through my own past. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I've wanted to talk to you for a long time. Uh, it's good to see you face to face and, uh, hopefully uh, I can't really, I honestly can't believe we haven't run into each other across the country at different things over all this time, but. I know. I know. Well, I mean, there haven't been things. For like That's two true. Years. We did have the COVID <laughs> thing. <laughs> so there was that. There was that. Yeah. All right. Well, but. thanks so much. And I hope you have a great night. Cool. Good talking to you. You too. Thanks so much for listening to the Decarceration Nation podcast. You can learn more about this episode in the notes or visit our website, www.decarcerationnation.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe and please like this episode and leave comments below. Special thanks to Andrew Stein, who does the editing and post-production for me, to Ann Espo for helping with our transcripts and social media images, and to Alex Mayo, who helps with our website and does the video transcription. Make sure and add us on social media and share our posts across your network. Also, thanks to my employer, Safe and Just Michigan, for helping to support the Decarceration Nation podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Decarceration Nation podcast. See you next time.